The final countdown is on to the New South Wales state election on March 25th, 2023. The Greens, Independents and other parties such as Socialist Alliance are looking to replicate their success in that phenomena that was the 2019 federal election. Today we will be talking to Green Left journalist and Socialist Alliance Upper House candidate Isaac Nellis. He's going to talk to us about his campaign and also about what it's like at 25 and the youngest candidate to live in such tumultuous times with such an uncertain climate future. Isaac, welcome and thank you for joining us. Hi, Suzanne. Thanks for having me on. Now, you graduated from film, TV and television school pretty much weeks before the pandemic hit. That must have been heartbreaking. Talk to us about what that was like and also how much of a difference did the additional pandemic payments, et cetera, make to you being able to put food on the table and keep a roof over your head? Yeah, yeah. So uh, like a lot of people, um, the pandemic obviously had a massive impact on on my life. So I just graduated yeah, from studying film uh, in the end of 2019 and was kind of looking for work and things like that uh, when we went into the first lockdown. So that was a big kind of disruption. And um, I think like a lot of people kind of forced uh, some reflection on like um, how we live our lives and how work fits into our lives. And um, I guess that it really showed how kind of fragile our our world is. Um, the kind of things that we all take for granted, like the different kind of systems and things that we all live day by day um, can just kind of change with a drop of a hat. Um, so, yeah, I think it was a kind of big eye-opening experience. I know a lot of people, um, a lot of people obviously impacted a lot of people in my generation have had the similar experiences of you kind of stepping out into the world as an adult and then it's kind of suddenly all stripped back. Um, and I know, for example, like my, my siblings who are, who are in school and stuff at the time were really disrupted. Um, but yeah, I think the, the good things that came out of it was that um, this kind of like society coming together in some ways uh, of people kind of being able to rethink how how they live their lives. Um, and, you know, one of the big things for me was uh, because I was out of work and um, in lockdown at the time, I was one of the people who got the uh, coronavirus uh, supplement payment on on Centrelink, which was basically they doubled the payments for JobSeeker and the other other Centrelink pay payments, um, and that made a massive difference for me. Like I don't know how people like myself who were on on Centrelink payments would have um, gotten through w without without that that supplement, um, particularly because a, a lot a lot of people who were on Centrelink and and uh, uh, do work like other jobs so they might, might work a couple of shifts a week or things like that and that supplements like tops up the Centrelink payment because it's it's really it's so low it's it's like 40 something dollars a day um and it's it's far below the poverty line so it's hard to pay for things like rents and food and bills like if you once you paid for all that you pretty much your your money's gone um if you can even afford that at all like i know people were skipping meals and um you know not being able to fill up their tanks of petrol and stuff. So um, having that extra payment made a massive difference and uh, really showed that, you know, governments can, if like the drop of a hat, just, just increase the payment if they wanted to, it just takes the political will um, to, to do so. It's not this kind of impossible thing that they try and tell us that it's like too hard to raise the payments. We can't afford it. And they show that they can just do it overnight. Um, so that, yeah, that was a really eye opening in terms of, how things can change uh, so quickly and how we can, you know, take the best out of a bad situation as well. You told me you became a lot more interested in politics during that time. Talk us through how you became involved in Socialist Alliance and how that got to you standing for the upper house. Yeah, so I think throughout kind of my late teenage life and, you know, spending time at university and things, it was, I'd always kind of sought thought uh, socialist kind of ideas and um, things were, were good. I always kind of identified with that, um, but I'd never really been involved in any active way. And I think uh, kind of having graduated from uni and, you know, having like this lockdown time where it's like it had a bit more time to, you know, read and, you know, think about things uh, like that, as well as being, you know, directly impacted by a massive uh, global event like that. Um, it was kind of like a good time for to to think about it and you know doing a lot of the kind of research and like reading about it online 
everything kept coming back to like oh it doesn't matter like if you've got all the right ideas you in the right perspectives it doesn't really matter unless you're actually doing something about it and and, and taking action um so I, I really took that to heart and uh that's when i kind of got in contact with socialist alliance and uh met uh rachel evans who's running in the seat of heffron in the election um and she kind of like introduced me to the party and things like that the other um aspect was during 2020 was the the black lives matter protests that were going obviously massive in the us but also in australia we had our own um particularly in sydney uh around uh, black deaths in custody um and those uh rallies were really kind of um you know inspiring and radicalizing for me to see like how much impact you know getting out on the streets and protesting for an important cause um could make a difference and also that um you know you go along to rallies and you kind of hear people speaking and you think oh that, that those ideas actually make sense i want to find out a bit more about what they're talking about so you know you, you get you get kind of inspired to get a bit more involved um and so yeah, that's when i joined socialist alliance and um you know here i am <laughs> now i'm standing as a candidate which is something i never kind of expected to i was never really like a someone who's been involved in politics and stuff before that um so it's a interesting experience and uh, in, enjoying it you know it's, it's quite good now you are a candidate i'd like to talk to you about your policy platform okay first of all in relation to housing and second of all i'd like to talk to you about climate policies in regards to housing first addressing the green driven housing crisis which obviously includes a relentless selling off of public housing and also tenants rights talk to me about your brief on that yeah so i think especially going into this new south wales election the housing crisis is is the big the big thing that um, everyone's talking about and it's been called a renter's election I've seen in the media um and I'm a renter myself so I kind of kind of experience I know the the kind of pain of of spending so much of your percentage of your income on, on you're in Sydney rent. yeah yeah I'm in Sydney um so yeah the house prices you know have, have, have been going up for, for years but they're really kind of um spiking at the moment um there's issues with like there's not actually a lot of rentals available um you know you got to be you got to spend so much of your money on on getting a house if you're in that position um and there then you've got to be paying off a mortgage for you know 30 years which is it's it's kind of a scary thing to be locked into um and I kind of experienced it firsthand in terms of renting uh when I last moved um last year where you know I was moving with my partner um and some friends trying to find like a share house in Sydney and literally applied for you know 10 20 30 places and they're all knocking us back um and that's kind of like uh ones that we could afford uh, we're kind of having to think oh we have to move further and further out of the city but even then there's, there's there's still not much available um to the point where it was almost like a couple of days before I would have had to you know either start sleeping on people's couches or you know um finding some other alternatives before because I couldn't find a place um and from all reports say it's it's gotten a lot worse even since then in the last kind of year um and I've known friends who have been hit with like 150 dollar rent increase a week um for a one bedroom apartment um we've heard stories in the media of increases of like 300 dollars a week um I think there's a landlord uh, there was a real estate agency in in Bondi or somewhere in the eastern suburbs that said um that was encouraging their um the landlords that the, the houses they managed to the best way to increase your um rent money is just to kick out your long-term tenants and get new people in and there's like massively long lines outside of all the um uh rentals that are that are available so it's a a really scary time um and definitely something that needs to be addressed and pretty much the two major parties don't really have anything on offer to actually address the crisis they talk about you know encouraging you know building more properties but um they're, they're not re really serious about making actual changes um because the problem is that housing is not just become something that you live in now housing is an investment um so investors hoarding massive amounts of properties I think there's a million properties uh across the country that are sitting empty every night um 
just left there because they, you know, get more and more valuable as, as they sit there. You don't have to worry about putting tenants in or anything. Um, so we need to address this balance and, and give make housing, you know, back for people and not for, for profits. Um, so one of the big campaigns we've been involved in in Sydney is for public housing. Um, so there's public housing blocks in inner city Sydney, like Waterloo and Glebe and other areas across the state that are all being threatened by the current uh, Liberal government. Um, they pretty much want to tear them down, uh, you know, build new apartment blocks that are mostly private with like a few uh, public housing uh, places sprinkled in. Um, and we're trying to, we've been involved in the campaigns to try and defend uh, these places from being demolished. Um, because, you know, some people have lived in these houses for 30 plus years, and that's like where their life is, their community, friends and family all live there. Um, and it's kind of, you know, destroying that uh, just to give some developers some profits um, when you could be building, you know, uh, houses in, in other areas and without demolishing public housing. Um, so one of the big things we're calling for is um, to build like an emergency plan of building 100,000 public housing homes within the next five years um, because there's a desperate need for it. There's more than 50,000 people on the waiting list in New South Wales and that doesn't seem to be getting shorter. Um, and, you know, if anything, knocking down places that we already have is not going to help. So that's that's a really important thing. And the other the other big one is we've been calling for a rent freeze for at least two years um, because you know I'm in a position where um, I mean a lot of people are in this position where your your lease agreement runs out um, you've got some repairs that you desperately need um, but there's this fear of of contacting your landlord or your agent um, to get things fixed or you know to sign a renew a lease because. You know, you might get hit with this massive rent increase. So um, I think that's uh, really impacting a lot of people. Um, you're either hit by the rent increase, and that's obviously like a really impactful thing um, when people are already struggling with cost of living, or the kind of the threat of it is there. It, it just discourages you from you know asking for things to be fixed and stuff like that, which you know is your right as a renter to to not live in a place that's falling apart. Um, so we really we need to address the balance between uh, renters and 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 landlords. Um, the other side of it is is the you know the, these empty vacant properties. Uh, so we've got a policy for if any properties are left vacant for a year or more, um, then they get reclaimed by the government and uh, put into the public housing stock. Um, so, so people can actually clear on that. There. We're referring to properties in a negative year. Would they get one year's negative year, and then after that, they have to be returned to housing stock? Is that correct? Well, yeah. It's like um, you know, sometimes a house might be vacant you know, while you're looking for tenants or things like that, or you're doing repairs, things like that. But if you're just letting it sit there um, and accumulate, you know, value because house prices continue to go up, um, then it's it's you know it's hard to justify that when there's people homeless on the streets, people struggling to get by and affording rents. Um, so it's, it's that aspect. And then it's the Airbnb aspect as well, where there's properties that people have, but they don't want to lease them out because they can make uh, more money on Airbnb. So that's been a big issue, particularly like um, in coastal towns. I know in Byron Bay, there was a protest a few months ago around Airbnbs because so many of the, the properties that are, you know, available, um, are actually being taken up by by Airbnb and other kind of companies like that. So it's a massive problem. Um, we need to because we need to bring housing back uh, as a human right. Um, public housing used to be this thing that you know nurses, teachers, all lived in public housing. Um, you pay like a small percentage of your income, and uh, it actually creates all these benefits for the whole of society, not just people who live there. Um, and now they've kind of made public housing this thing for only the really disadvantaged people, people struggling with, you know, things like addiction or um, uh, illnesses and mental health um, and kind of made people think of public housing as this thing that they don't want. Um, whereas we kind of want to re, re, uh, renew that back to what it actually is, is, you know, we have public hospitals, we've got public schools. Why can we not have public housing? Um, it's just another thing that's been privatized uh, over the past you know five decades or so 
I'd like to talk now about climate change. And I can't imagine how frustrating it must be for your generation to face such an uncertain climate future when we know it's all driven by self-interested governments and a fossil fuel lobby, basically. So what's it like for you as a young person living through that now? And how does the Socialist Alliance campaign address climate change and also the economic changes that are also required? Yeah, it, it's very frustrating. Um, I think people like my uh, age and, and obviously younger as well, we've learned about climate change and the impacts of it in school. Um, and you kind of think, oh, that's that's kind of a terrifying thing that's happening. But, you know, it, it, people will fix it because it's like a big problem. Um, and then as you as you kind of, you know, things move on, you get older and you kind of you see that things aren't actually happening. Um that people, governments aren't taking this seriously enough. Um, they they kind of talk the big talk, but don't actually provide any real solutions, concrete solutions. Um, and you know, same same with the big uh, companies that you know they brag about how they've got eco friendly products and everything's recycled and renewable. But if you look into it, uh, it's all just this kind of greenwashing where they they try and make themselves look good without actually making a change. So it is frustrating for you know as something that seems so obvious that we need to fix like not just here but across the like internationally it's going to affect so many people um, that just things don't seem to be getting done um so yeah it's quite a scary thing i think that as we we're just talking about housing before um and climate it's just it's hard for young people to to look into the future and see like what their life might be like it's like well I might not be able to afford a house, so I might, might be renting for the rest of my life. And then the other thing is that, um, you know, the climate crisis might continue to worsen and I might uh, be living in this almost like apocalyptic kind of future scenario where there's bushfires every year and then floods every other year. And, um, you know, that's going to make all these other problems worse. How many times could the press use the word unprecedented? Yeah, exactly. It seems every year there's un unprecedented uh floods and fires things happening um and it's the other thing is it's gonna is the climate crisis will affect um disadvantaged people first so people in countries in poorer countries are already being uh, displaced and impacted by food shortages and water shortages because of climate change um and we're quite lucky in australia as a fairly rich country that we've kind of uh don't have that immediate impact but we're seeing you know the fires and the floods and um you know it's things like there's going to be you know climate refugees going to be a massive thing uh in the future if, if this isn't addressed um and the response to that we've seen from the government is like just kind of you know let's put up these strong borders and and blockade everyone out um and you know not actually make any of the meaningful change that we need. So social alliances policies kind of uh, are address, uh, designed to address the, the real culprits of climate change, which is obviously the fossil fuel companies. Um, so we're standing for no, no uh, new coal, gas or oil um, in Australia and uh, want 100% renewable energy by 2030. Um, you know, that's kind of the most basic thing that we need to do is invest in renewable energy um, and and move away from, you know, coal and gas, which is all just polluting the atmosphere. I mean, Australia is one of the highest uh, exporters of coal uh, in the world, especially when you look at it per capita as well. We're, we're really bad kind of on an international scale um, and particularly under the uh, kind of, the last 10 years of the uh, Liberal national government in, in federal uh, politics have basically taken no action. Um, so we've got policies that we to address uh, the climate crisis, but I think what gets missed out from a lot of the media discussion around climate, um, you know, you see the Greens uh, announcing their, their policies and Labor's got their like safeguard mechanism, which actually won't uh do anything to address the climate crisis because it actually doesn't stop emissions at all it just uh gives companies oh you have to buy these carbon credits um 
and it's like they're pretty dodgy offsets. As had a bet on insiders recently, you can't put the fire out while you're still pouring, pouring petrol on it. It's as simple as that, really. And what do yeah. you say to people? I often get told Australia couldn't possibly survive without the revenue from coal and gas. I think Michael West on occasion has comprehensively proven that's not true. What's your view on that statement? Yeah, I think, well, it sounds like it's something that you would, would make sense if you think, oh, we're taking away this revenue stream um, and what are we going to do without it? But the whole point is that you replace it with a renewable energy um, system. So a, an important part of it is a just transition for the fossil fuel workers. So we don't want to close down all these mines and then leave people uh, without jobs without you know a, 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 their lives have been built around working in these in, in these industries um but what we can do is use all these really skilled workers um and set up a renewable energy um industry in australia um and we can you know be exporting renewable energy out um internationally and and with the kind of skills that we have and we can be researching uh, and in, improving investing in renewables so that we can actually be like the kind of renewable energy, you know, leaders. Well, something that we could have been if we started doing this 10 years ago, but there's still time to, to catch up. Um, so I think it's, it's, if you look at it from like that kind of perspective, it from a, a purely financial perspective, it's, it's missing out on the, the bigger picture, but at the same time, from a financial perspective, it still makes sense because, you know, a lot of other countries are stopping, are slowing down with their fossil fuel use so you know china uh is is really slowing down on its purchasing of coal from australia so and it's so it's something that's already kind of starting to fade away anyway so we might as well you know take the initiative and and make our, our society and our country better in that way um yeah by investing in in renewable energy um I think the other aspect is is with transport and the climate. I think that's a, a thing, something that's really closely connected, um, and obviously housing as well. Is with the we we don't want to be investing in all these new things like say roads and housing and things that are just going to also make the climate crisis worse. Um, so we need to be thinking about it from a like a holistic kind of way of like we need to be making our transport systems more sustainable, our housing more sustainable, as well as cutting down on fossil fuels and investing in renewable energy. Um, and yeah, so it, uh, what, what I was going to mention is that it's not just down to if you vote for me and you vote for Socialist Alliance candidates, then we'll put the policy in for you and then it will be sorted. What we actually need is, you know, grassroots mobilizations, um, of you know trade unions uh, activists we've already seen the the school strikers starting to take action again this year um, and we need to come together uh, and get on the streets and kind of force the the change because I don't think that the governments who get all this funding and donations from fossil fuel companies um, are going to be that keen to you know cut off cut off their main um, donors uh, unless we force them to with, you know, some action on the streets. That brings me to my final question, which was about getting young people successfully and positively engaged more in politics. Now, you look like a great young candidate and it's terrific to see that you obviously believe it's still worth fighting for, which certainly gives someone like me a bit of heart. So what are your strategies? How do you see that panning out? What can we do to assist young people get more positively engaged in politics, especially when it's become such a toxic environment to operate in. Yeah, it has has become quite toxic. And I think something that I felt as a when I was younger and before I got involved in politics was looking at, uh, you know, you see the kind of videos from Parliament and the like bickering debates from the uh, politicians. And it just see, it all seemed so kind of pointless and childish. And to an extent, you know, how it's set up at the moment where you can only really get elected as one of the like the two major parties holding this kind of power um, and they're almost basically the same like on a vast majority of points uh, i just saw an inter uh, debate the debate with uh, dominic perrottet and chris mins um where they almost pretty much agreed on every single point and they're going back and forth saying yeah like i agree with what he said um but we're you know we're labor so we'll do it better or vice versa um 
So I can see why a lot of young people are checked out from politics. It kind of seems this kind of like other thing that's not going to affect my day to day life. Um, but I think what, you know, COVID and, you know, the, the current housing and climate crisis um, shows that it is something that is going to impact people's lives and, you know, more and more so if these things don't get addressed. Um, and so I think part of getting young people involved is going to be showing them that they can make a difference and they can have a voice. Um, it's not just like, oh, you're going to come along and do the grunt work while the the top people on the top to sit there and have these bicker in parliament and stuff like that. It's like showing them that, you know, if you come out and get active and, and get out on the streets and, you know, demand things that you want, because it's, it's going to be their, their world going forward. So it's like, we're going to have to inherit the problems that are not dealt with by the people in power at the moment. Um, but as the school strikers have shown, you can have a massive impact even before you've graduated like school, uh, which is really inspiring. And I think, you know, I, I wasn't involved in the, the school strike wasn't around when I was at school, but I think it would have been a really inspiring kind of um, thing to get involved in. Um, the other thing that we're standing for is uh, the voting age, uh, changing it to 16, because I think 16 year olds uh, have as much, you know, at stake and as much, uh, you know, understanding what's going on as, as 18 year olds and older um, and they can, you know, actually have a, have a say over, over what happens. The 16 year olds are already working. They're, you know, paying taxes, things like that. Um, and looking, you know, looking to the future of like, well, what am I going to do once I finish school and things like that? Uh, so I think that's an important initiative uh, is to get more young people voting. Um, so I think there's a whole, whole bunch of different ways of showing uh, that it is worth getting involved for young people. Uh, and part of that is like making things happen that they are actually inspired by and, and not just seeing it as this kind of irrelevant, uh, you know, thing that these people in suits that have nothing in common with, with me are doing. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really a uh, important part of it. If young people or indeed anybody do want to become involved and look more closely at Socialist Alliance as an organisation and in particular at your good self as a candidate. Can you give us a website or some other information on where they can go to get some information on that? Yeah, for sure. So Socialist Alliance website is um, socialistalliance.org. Um, but also the other, the other way that young people get their information is through social media. So we're on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter, uh, I know that Green Left is on TikTok, so that's for the the Gen Z people who are getting all their stuff from TikTok. You can check out the the Green Left TikTok. Um, but yeah, if you're interested as well, if like you're watching this and you want to find out more about Socialist Alliance, yeah, go to our social medias. Uh, if you send a message to any of them, um, you'll you'll get a, a quick response, and we'd love to have uh, people involved, um, you know, from all spectrums of society, and and hear your perspectives. So yeah, it's really important to. To, you know reach out if you're interested well, Isaac, thank you so much for outlining your candidacy for us today and all those other issues we spoke about i wish you the best of luck in the campaign it must be very hard work thanks suzanne yeah it's, it's getting to the crunch time now uh not long to go so okay well best of luck and thank you so much for speaking with us today thank you that was Isaac Gellist. He's an upper house candidate for Socialist Alliance in the upcoming New South Wales state election. I'm Suzanne James for Green Left. If you like our work, don't forget to like and subscribe to our video channel, or you can go to greenleft.org.au to see the many ways, financial and otherwise, that you can contribute to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. I'm Suzanne Grant James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.